100% of the fish that we catch and let go out of the boat survive. That's not true. Our anglers are giving us in trust. They're sharing their lunker. 35% of those fish that were turned into the program died. To me, I still think like it's a win either way. We put our heart and soul into this. We gotta remember that not every fish spawns every year. And so I think after all this, you know, the question that we started with was, should humans be breeding largemouth bass to put in public lakes? Well, how's it going everybody? And welcome back to Tyler's Real Fishing. I am excited about today's episode because it's a little bit different than usual. I had the opportunity to sit down and chat with a very important man when it comes to fishing, especially bass fishing in the state of Texas. And his name is Tom Lang. Tom is the director of the Texas Freshwater Fishery Center, which is the hub of all fishing related scientific research in the state of Texas. The TFFC is known for their Florida strain bass stocking program, which puts bass in public bodies of water all across the state of Texas. And they're also known for the Toyota Shale Lunker program. Now, as a lot of y'all know, I caught a 14 and a half pound bass that I submitted into the Shale Lunker program. And so in this interview, I'm gonna be asking all the tough questions because the program is not without its controversy. We're gonna talk about the mortality rate. We're gonna talk about how science has advanced their ability to keep fish healthy and spawn them for future Future generations. I am so excited about this interview. If you like learning about how science and bass fishing converge to make better fisheries for everyone, you're going to love this interview too. Let's jump into it. Well, how's it going everybody and welcome back to TRF. I'm excited about this episode because I get to sit down with Tom Lang, who is the director, the man who runs everything here at the Texas Freshwater Fishery Center and is one of the visionaries that keeps the Share Lunker program going. And so, is that correct to say that? Uh, we got a great team here, Tyler. Yeah. <laughs> I just try to keep us going down the right track. Exactly. So for those of y'all who don't know, I mean, you're probably watching this video because the title said something to the effect of, should we be breeding largemouth bass? Should, should we be making bass genetically better fish? And so the topic of this podcast is that, but the only reason why I'm doing this is because I caught a fish very similar to some of the ones you see on the wall behind me. This is the top 10 current, correct? Yeah, the top 10 share of lunkers. Yeah. Uh, except we got one replica still getting made since we had number seven caught this year. Exactly. So, so Chris Adams, the 16.4 from Lake Fork is getting kicked out and the, the list is being updated. But I caught a share lunker, a fish that in Texas is a 13 pound or bigger. Uh, and now the legacy edition is when you give your fish to the program. And we're going to talk about all that in this, uh, this interview here with Tom. I have a bias in this interview, but I will attempt to make my questions unbiased. So I've seen it all in terms of the Facebook comments, the pushing forum comments of, of people who have issues, let's just say, with the program. Um, maybe some that are, that are you know, right to think that, and maybe some that aren't. And so my goal for this interview is to ask the man who has all the answers here in Athens, Texas, uh, about the Cheryl Lunker program. Uh, he'll tell you guys all about it. And of course, we're gonna answer a lot of the, what I call myths about freshwater bass stocking, and of course, how the Share Lunker program fits into that. Now let's jump into it. What is the Share Lunker program? So it's it's really citizen science before citizen science was cool. Okay. I mean, this is an angler industry agency partnership to make bigger, better bass for current and future generations. Okay. And, uh, and so that's, that's really the, the long and short of it is we're all working together to help make the absolute best bass fishing in the world right here in Texas and to keep it that way. Gotcha. Now let's, let's, deep, let's dive into the, the, the thick of the Share Lunker program. <laughs> so now we know it's to create bigger, better bass. How does one enter into the Share Lunker program? Right. How does the Share Lunker program operate? Well, Some since 1986, like uh, the way this operates is if you catch a a 13 plus pound bass anywhere in the state, you call us on our hotline mm -hmm. and we hop in that share lunker truck, that Toyota Tundra, and we come and meet you to pick that fish up. Yeah. Uh, and as you see, you know, back behind us here, up there in the top right is Mark Stevenson's fish. The, mm -hmm. the first share lunker, share lunker number one, Ethel, was 17.67 pounds. Yeah. She was the state record at the time. Correct. And this is a time, you gotta remember, you know, since 1986, there's a lot of things that have changed over the past 36 years. There's been regulations, mm -hmm. there's been research, there's been developments in hatcheries, there's habitat management, yeah. but there's also been changes in social ethics too. That's true. Catch and release. For instance, yeah. you know, why would anybody give you their fish, you know? <laughs> when they could have it on their dinner right. plate. <laughs> and, and, this, and this gentleman who's in our Texas Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame right here at TFFC, yeah. Mark Stevenson kicked all, this all off by saying, 
oh, I gave them a state record, <laughs> you know. Exactly. And uh, and so that really got got things going. And and really what that Share Local program does is we take those bass and we spawn them right here at TFFC with the male offspring of previous share lunkers. So we're just doubling yeah. down on on that uh, that proven ability, that proven lineage, that yeah. heritage of being able to produce a big old bass. So you say proven lineage. When somebody talks about, I, the two that come into my mind first are, are deer and bass. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about genetics, can any bass reach this size? No, absolutely not. Okay, got it. So explain <laughs> explain why that is. Well, so I mean, you know, you can look at the evidence out there. So uh, there's a, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of fishery science and research that has been going on, yeah. is going on, and will continue to go on. Remember, science is a process, mm -hmm. right? Correct. It's not an end all be all. And yeah. so uh, when we're making these, uh, you know, big bass and going through this process and, and learning that it is about learning and it is yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, to moving forward and 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 this is just one one part of the puzzle but we want to make sure we get this puzzle right you know this part of the puzzle right exactly so you guys as the texas parks of wildlife or the fresh fishery center i don't know who's been in charge of it have been stocking florida strain bass in texas for a long time correct absolutely and so texas parks and wildlife uh tffc is the, the one of our five freshwater fish hatcheries for okay. texas parks and wildlife got it and we've been stocking four largemouth bass uh, since the 1970s. Okay. And and actually, our division director at the time, who's also in the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame, yeah, uh, paid for those four bass out of his own pocket to okay. get that started here. Got it. Got right. It. And so let's let's not forget about that. Yeah. Very uh, cool. You know, that's that's what we do is is be progressive and do what it takes to to try and get the job done and give those a chance. So, exactly. So not all fish can grow over you know to to that size, right? Yeah. So really, first off, we're talking about um subspecies right so we're talking yeah, about yeah. florida largemouth bass or their hybrids mm -hmm. that have the opportunity to grow to that size so a northern strain so somebody who lives in missouri and above those fish can't grow uh, it's this. it's well it's very difficult correct okay. it's very difficult it's very difficult because of their genetics it's very difficult because of um the the growing seasons that they have yeah yeah um also in the um the ability for their fisheries to produce the prey base that's necessary. And so yeah. there's a lot of factors that go into those things. Here in Texas, a lot of those factors come together. Yeah, yeah. We've got big waters, we've got good habitat, thanks to like Friends of Reservoirs chapters and our sure. and our biologist efforts to enhance habitat. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you have the longer growing seasons that you need, and now we're putting the right genetics with those pieces. And exactly. all those things come together and get baked into that cake. So you get the yeah. right subspecies, so Florida bass, and then we're cherry picking from there even further. <laughs> That's true. Right? And, uh, and then we have the, the longer growing seasons. There's a reason why, you know, 29 state state records are not even 13 pounds. And we've got 10 over 16 behind us. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> because all the puzzle pieces for Texas specifically come, come, together. come together so well. And you have 200, you know, inland fisheries employees in this state. Okay. Uh, all working together yeah. to produce and put in to, to work the best fishery science. Exactly. And we have our anglers out there participating in the program. Yeah. And we have our industry partners and our prize sponsors helping to fund the program uh, as well. And mm -hmm. so it's it's our industry, agency, angler partnership all coming together yeah. to do this. That's awesome. Yeah. And I got to see that firsthand with Cheryl Lunker 609. Yeah, that what I was? 609. So when I caught my fish again, if y'all haven't watched the video, just click the link. I mean, it's a really cool experience and I, He's in, he's in the video as well. I got to bring my fish to the, the lake and they had a place to, to weigh it at OHIV. They then sent the truck, brought it here, and then I got to kind of be uh, you know, vicariously brought through <laughs> the whole process as the fish was uh, rejuvenated to make it the healthiest it can be and then spawned, and then I got to release that fish. And so that's kind of the, what the Cheryl Lunker program uh, looks like from, a, from an angler's perspective. Uh, what does it look like from the biologist perspective yeah <laughs> well from a biologist perspective it's 
It's preparing, uh, making sure our facility is ready to go to take in those fish. Mm -hmm. It's working with our response team, our biologists all across the state. So in the yeah. last couple of years, we've actually uh, done a response team. Okay. So our biologists across the state are ready to respond, to be able to meet anglers faster than we've ever met them before. Correct. They were to, there quick to the Ivy. And to get, yeah. and, and, and Ivy, God love it. We love Ivy. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's out, out way far <laughs> out west, right? <laughs> and uh, so it, it's, it's a ways. It's a ways here from TFFC. Yeah. But our biologists in San Angelo, our crew out there, that inland fisheries team, man, they're they're there quickly exactly. to take care of that fish. And then they can, one that provides better service to the anglers, so you're not waiting around four, five, six hours, because Texas is a big old state. Yes, it is. And we can get a hold of that fish and get that in the care of a biologist quicker, and then get that here to TFFC, right? Yeah. And so it's kind of like, um, you know, we got this fish, man, what do we do? Okay, the paramedics are on the way. So the ambulance gets there, mm -hmm. right? And so we're giving the first class fish health care. Yeah. Because it's stressful to be caught. It is. It's stressful I'm to sure. go through that. And so we get a good health care, good care, and then we get it back, you know, to the hospital here to get it the best care. Mm -hmm. But we're going to get it in care. And so, um, so we've seen, you know, a lot of, um, and so that's part of it, preparing, making sure everybody's on the same page, has the gear that they need, has the equipment that they need, yeah. uh, coordinating and organizing all that then having the hatchery ready to accept those fish and having everything we need to take care of them once they get here. Got it. And then preparing for the spawning process yeah. and having the, the equipment and the things we need to pair them up and spawn those. By the way, exactly. while continuing to grow brood stock out there, those male offspring, yes. so they're ready to spawn with them at the right time. Correct, so while, every, everything's a timing game. Absolutely it is. Yeah. And while getting our ponds ready to go, so when those fish spawn, our ponds are ready with good phytoplankton and zooplankton for okay. those young fry and fingerlings to eat, yeah. to grow, to get bigger and be ready to go. So it's all about timing and it's all about preparation and, yeah. and we're all wholly devoted to doing it and doing it right. So when I mean, when I was young looking at the Sri Lanka program, I kind of figured that you just took my fish and put it in a fish tank and we're like, go at it, buddy, <laughs> do your thing. But as I've been a part of the program, as you explained, I mean, like there's so much science behind it, mm -hmm. um, which, is, which is really, really cool to see. Now, the kind of next stage in terms of the program is called the Lone Star, Lone Star Bass, correct? Right, so that's, a, that's an expansion of the Sherry Lunker program. And so uh, we know that looking at the genetic makeup of the bass turned into uh, the, the Sherry Lunker program are by and large, mostly Florida bass. Got it. A good bit of them are pure Florida bass, uh -huh. but if you look at their genetics, they're not all pure Floridas. Most of them are actually hybrids. They're actually okay. Northern and Florida mixed, Got but it. their genetic makeup is mostly Florida. Okay. Two thirds, three quarters or better mm -hmm. Florida makeup. Correct. And so that's, that's part of that, you know? And so that, that goes into that, but those pure Floridas, right? Yeah. So which given those big genetic potential when we brought those Floridas in. So that Lone Star Bass program is taking those pure Florida share lunkers and keeping back some of their offspring and we made brood stock out of those. Yeah. And so all of the pure Floridas moving forward in Texas are not just pure Florida bass. They're Lone Star bass because they are okay. pure Floridas with yeah. share lunker heritage. Okay. So we know that that's so how it, it's so, like. So every bass now <laughs> stocked in the state of Texas has the potential to reach this size. Every pure, every pure Florida that's stocked wow. has a, pr a proven history yeah. in their family's tree to have a fish that's over 13 pounds. And, and that wouldn't, 2022, when we're filming this, that wouldn't have been possible to say without the program's history. So with, right. without, Absolutely. without creating the brood stock, without keeping enough fish back, mm -hmm. we, we wouldn't have better, bigger, better bass for <laughs> everybody. Right. Without. And that's what's awesome about the program. Yeah. It's anglers on one of the best days of their life, catching the biggest fish of their life, you yep. know, most likely. Correct. Uh, or certainly one of them. We'll see about next year. <laughs> right? And what they do is they share that to help us make yeah. the best fish of somebody else's life. And you got to remember, these fish take a decade to make. Yeah. On average, a 13 plus bass, a 13 is plus 10, pound bass is, is, is a decade old. Okay. And it's up to 14 years old or 15. They're, yeah. they're old fish. They they're are. geriatric fish. <laughs> I guess you so. Know? <laughs> so that's part of it, too. Exactly. So I got my notes out here just so we can stay on track. Um, there's, I guess we'll, we'll hop into one of the, the earliest problems that I heard about, and that is the inherent risks of a program like this. And I think that's why some guys might decide to not turn their fish mm -hmm. in. Because I can, I can say that 
when I caught that fish and I'm holding it in a tank and you guys are coming, it's not a bass anymore. It's like, this is my friend right? and I'm connected to this thing. And I'm sure everybody on this wall and a part of the program feels that. And so I think some guys catch an absolutely humongous bass and just don't want to take that risk. So what are the risks associated with yeah. this, the, the journey to Athens and the program as a whole? Well, well, first off, you know, again, we're talking about geriatric fish. Yeah. And it is a, it's stressful. It's stressful to be caught. Correct. You want to you wanna guarantee 100% of these share lunkers uh, don't die from fishing? Then don't fish. Yeah. But, man, we make them to fish. We Correct. make them to catch them. We make <laughs> yeah. them to enjoy them, right? Yeah, exactly. And so I, would, I want everybody to go out and fish and enjoy these fish, right? Yeah. But, um, you know, that's part of it is, is fish die. And unfortunately they do, yeah. you know, especially when we're talking about, like I said, fish near the end of their lives. Correct. So you got to prove that you're over 13 pounds. Well, <laughs> it's going to take you a decade to do it. How much life do you have left? And totally. so, so there's an inherent risk there and there's stress of being caught. Yeah. There's stress of being held in a live well. There's stress of being hauled down the road. Yeah. But again, that's what we liken it to. We're getting our biologists there as fast as possible. Mm -hmm to do the things that we need to do to give that fish the best health care, period. And I think one of those myths that um, that unfortunately is perpetuated is that, well, I let that fish go and it swam off. Yeah. So 100% of the fish that we catch and let go out of the boat survive. That's not true. Yeah. They certainly don't all survive to spawn. And they don't all spawn every year either. Correct. Uh, so yeah. you might have let that fish go and it, you know, it may die in two days. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the fish that we take back have, have perished. Yeah. Um, but I will tell you that, that we continue to grow and refine that science. Exactly. And we know that there's such a thing called, you know, natural mortality. Every year, yeah. every age class, part of those fish die. Correct. And part of them move on. Yeah. And there's, a, there's a, a substantial percentage that move on. And so these are fish that have been through that. And part of these big bass are going to die every year naturally. Exactly. Uh, we don't like that. No. You don't. know, we want to do the best thing for them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we also want to make sure that their genetics, that their lineage is, is, is taken yeah. and utilized to help better the future. Right? That's what we're about. Totally. And so we do all these things to try and help make sure that we're minimizing any mortality. So, so let's talk a little bit about mortality. Right? Correct. Yeah. So we have some data here. People want to know, they've asked, uh, I've seen it before, like, oh, the Share Lunker program hides how many fish have died because they don't mm. want, they don't want to know how, <laughs> how much of a failure the program is and how they kill all the fish. I heard that growing up from yeah. people in Austin because if somebody's buddy lost a fish in the program and then somebody else did, and it's like, if two guys did, then everybody did. <laughs> and sure. so uh, we'll have some graphics on the screen here that, that Tom and I will talk about as, uh, as you guys can see those. First, we'll go about the legacy entries throughout the years. So mm -hmm. what y'all are seeing on the screen right now, we have the first one in 1986, which is that one right there, correct? Yeah. That was, that so, was the only one submitted that year. <laughs> well, it was Thanksgiving when he caught it. So it wasn't really. <laughs> November 26th, so gotcha. right, right around Thanksgiving. So, so there wasn't a whole lot that year. That very end of that year. And then the next two years, 7, 13, 23, 29, all the way to the 30s, the capacity <laughs> was in the 30s for those first few right. those years, correct? Absolutely. And so part of that is you had a booming lake fork. Okay. So you've had 40% of the fish turned into this program coming out of one reservoir. Correct. All, all of these are lake fork, correct? Behind right. us? Yeah. All, all 10 of these behind us are all from lake fork. Yeah. I mean, it's a legendary lake fork for a reason, right? <laughs> it is, it I mean, is. And so it's driving a system and lake fork still produces uh, lots of great fish. Lake fork has tremendous fishing pressure though. Yeah. yeah. And lake fork also um, is aging. Exactly. Right, and so exactly. habitat is deteriorating. That's why our habitat efforts, that's why Friends of Reservoirs chapters out there to help us mm -hmm. restore habitat correct, are correct. so important because all of our nation's reservoirs, the habitat's deteriorating in them. Mm -hmm. And so the more that we can, you know, help, help that habitat, the longer we're going to be able to, you know, correct. have these great fisheries. Yeah, yeah. And so, so Fork skews the numbers a yeah. little bit. So you <laughs> got to keep that, that in mind. The other thing is, is that we're talking about a program where our our dates have changed. And it's, this goes hand in hand with mortality, right? Yeah, so, so when, when, what was the collection season in terms of when somebody can turn in their fish and y'all take it? Yeah, it was year round. So, so <laughs> January 1st or July 4th? Oh, it was year, it was January, yeah, it didn't matter. It didn't matter, any yeah, day. Yeah, 24-7, 365, you call, we're coming to get that fish. And Got I don't it. know, 
some of our you know friends watching this in other states may not realize Texas gets pretty hot. Texas gets real hot. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> water at Lake Travis when I grew up in the '90s during the day. Yeah, I mean it just I don't know how fish can do it and survive in that. Well, that's a, that's a problem. You're getting to the high of some of their their thermal tolerances, mm -hmm. and then you're putting them in a stressful situation. Correct. So now they're stressed from the heat, and now they're stressed. Now you're adding a hauling stress on top of it. Yeah. And so that's been, that was a problem. Yeah. You know that was a problem, and then we had to hold on to those fish that much longer to spawn the next year as well. Yeah. So now you catch a fish in July, we're keeping that fish. Till you know, April, like, yeah. that's a long time. To spawn yeah. and that's taking care of that fish, that's other things that can happen. Um, and so uh, cutting that down, uh, then we, so then we cut that season down to six months. It was November to April. And now we're just January, February and March. Yeah. And so one, that changes the number of entries, right? Correct. And yeah. so that's why we have that legend class, right? Outside uh -huh. of January, February, March, you catch a 13 pounder. Yeah. We want to know it. We want fin uh, we want scale samples so we can understand genetics about it. Mm -hmm. So you can take those scales and, and send those to us and uh, we can have that data and, and know about it. But we don't want to risk killing that fish. In, the, in, in these times that we know it's more difficult to. Exactly. So we'll go ahead and put that back. And we know these are more riskier times. So yeah. let that fish go. And we just collect them January, February, and March now. So that changes the number of entries from year to year a little bit. You know, yeah. that, that artificially decreases them. Um, so that, that's, that's part of that. The other thing though, is that it helps our survival rates because we want to make sure Correct. we're, these fish that our anglers are giving us in trust that they're loaning us their fish. They're sharing their lunker, right? Yeah, yeah. That they're they're giving us in trust that we're doing everything we can to one, make sure that it spawns, and to make those fish, and then to get their fish back to them healthy to return Correct. to potentially catch another day or somebody else can catch. Yeah. Which, by the way, has happened. I know it has. Yeah. You know that like uh, Alan Henry. We've had Alan that, fish from that, Alan Henry. That's crazy. That was turned in three times. I know that fish Same is dumb. Fish. She <laughs> It's dumb and big. That's what we like. Dumb and big. I guess so. I don't so, know. <laughs> so I put that on the screen just so people can understand kind of the ebb and flows and how the seasons. But then the next one is the, an identical chart, but it shows the mortality. So the red is how many died of the total collected on the on the far left uh, y axis. And so, why do you think so many percentage wise more died early on in the program uh -huh. as opposed to now? Right. So so one there wasn't any any data or research really out there okay. on handling some of these big fish. Who, who had fish like this to do the, any of that with, right? And I think back we then- We started going through that process. Yeah, yeah, and there wasn't catch and release back then? Was there? <laughs> Not much? Not, well, I mean, you're talking early 80s. It was certainly early in the yeah, ethic, yeah. you know. The um, tournament trails probably still had six fish stringers. We also didn't, <laughs> we still didn't also have the holding facilities like we have. True. We didn't know that what we knew, what we know now and the research, research that our inland fisheries team has done on mm -hmm. fish care, yeah. you know, on things like salt, on things like uh, air stones. Live wells have changed. Yeah. Live, I mean, how about back then, you know, was a live well extra? Like, did you have to pay extra to have a it live well? It probably was, yeah. I'm sure you're, <laughs> <laughs> I was a little young then too. I'm sure your, your viewers could tell us like, oh, that's an option. That's an add-on, right? I think every bass boat that I've ever seen in my <laughs> lifetime had a live well. <laughs> but I don't know, in the early 80s, maybe, you know, that was a little bit different. But, Got it. Uh, anyway, I'm just saying. So but, you're saying uh, that fish, in that time period, fish not only came in less healthy. And you're taking, so then you're, so there's not the research out there. Correct. And so people care, people want to do the right thing. Yeah. But there's not the research to educate them about what the right thing is. Got it. And so as we get to handle some more of these big fish, that's a lot of what's come out of the legacy of this program mm -hmm. is better handling techniques, better research, better focus on these bass. Got it. You know, and so we had what from 86 through the 90s, a 65% survival rate. So 35% of those fish that were turned into the program died. And remember, we're yeah. taking fish in July, August, September, That's true. June. And so, I mean, yeah. we just got through a couple couple weeks here in June of 100 plus degree days, I know. you know. So, I know. Um, and so then, so we, we start narrowing those windows down and then you get over in the 2000s to, to 2021, you're talking about going from a 65% survival to an 84% survival. Yeah. You know, as these ethics, this, this education gets out there, we're, we're changing procedures. We're changing our procedures on hauling. We're changing our procedures on how we treat those fish after. Yeah. Uh, we're refining those. To say yeah. changing, we're refining them. We're making them better. Yeah. And, and again, like I said at the beginning, science is a process. And so that process is evolving. And that's why we see that 
65% survival early years, mm -hmm. moving to an 84% survival. Correct. For the last four years, we've had 90, a 94% survival. 94% survival rate. In this season, we had 100% survival. Every yeah. fish was released a lot. And I, and I don't just say survival rate. My fish that entered the program not doing well. I mean, I caught her deep. She was belly up. We, we, we nursed her to health. Mm -hmm. And when I released her, after a stressful drive here, after living in a tank that was not as big as her home waters, and after spawning, I released her, and she was more energetic right. and more full of energy than I when, than when I caught her from the lake, mm -hmm. which just goes to show that the research y'all have done and the, the, uh, the pride you guys have in right. taking care of the fish, uh, it shows. And th well, think about fizzing, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, look at the yeah. look at the change in fizzing. I mean, we're still trying to help folks understand not to fizz through the mouth. Yeah, yeah. Today, but where we, how much fizzing was even happening? Correct. And then, or the you know that that changes a lot of health. And then, how long are you fizzing? Are they over fizzing them? Mm -hmm. You know, and so are you hitting the reap mirabile? So then it doesn't you damage the organ, and that that swim bladder is not going to work. So exactly. there's a lot of research happening on that, and uh, and frankly, we prefer that anglers when they turn in a lunker not fizz it. Yeah. We'll take care of it. Correct. And uh, we'll you, get it back you here. You guys are all the pros. So. And we, you know, I mean, we're not perfect. We, we know that. Um, but we, we put our heart and soul into this. Yeah. And I can tell you that we take it very seriously. You know, Tyler, when you, when you decided to share your lunker with us, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're ecstatic. You yeah. know, we, we can't wait to get out there. But we're treating that like, you know, it was our fish Correct. or our kids fish, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, if it was my kids fish, I'd treat it even better than my fish, right? Uh -huh. and, and and we want to make sure that um, we, we don't violate that trust. Yeah. You put that trust in us to do the best thing possible for the health of that fish and the health of the fisheries of Texas. Yeah. And we take that seriously. Our people have devoted their lives to this profession. Mm -hmm. You know, this exactly. isn't something we do on a weekend. We devote our lives to this profession. And when you give us the opportunity to take care of that very special fish, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we take that and make better fishing for everybody. Exactly. You know, yeah. this, this program, by the way, uh -huh. because of this program and all this work, you know, like we talk about how big a 13 pound bass is. It's huge. It, you know, this season, we get 75 different public lakes that have turned in a 13 plus pounder to this program. Yeah. Like you can talk about, like man, we got the Great Lake in this state, or we got a Great Lake in this state. Do we have seventy five? seventy five different lakes in Texas that have produced thirteen plus pound bass. Yeah. For this program alone. Correct. Public lakes. Yeah. Public waters. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Lake Fork is, is amazing. Oh is probably the hottest bass factory in the world right now. But we have seventy three others. But I mean, yeah. where else well, you want to go? Just go. Exactly. That's fantastic, <laughs> and that and that and I, I can say that's partly due to the Florida strain efforts. Now, what number, we're gonna go back to stocking here for a second, because they, they do all the stocking. You're not, you don't grow all the bass here. There's a bunch of hatcheries around the state. So this but, is, uh, so most of our hatcheries actually uh, focus on different species. Okay. They do cross over um, and, and help with other species, depending on yeah. what our biologist needs are. But uh, by and large, the vast majority of, of largemouth bass are produced here at TFFC. Okay, cool. And, but then also at our AE Wood Hatchery in San, in San Marcos. And so you gave me a number on the phone a, a, mm -hmm. a ballpark guesstimate, but since the, since Tex Parks and Wildlife started stocking Florida strain, and mm -hmm. now with the inclusion of all the Sherry Lunker DNA, how many fingerlings do you think y'all have stocked oh, in the state uh, of Texas, which has led to 75 lakes having? Well, I haven't looked that up in the database, you know, so I, as a scientist, I want to give you like the exact number. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that said, I, what I can say is that we started doing this in the 70s. We uh -huh. certainly weren't producing what we do produce now. Correct. Right, but but now uh, we shoot for four to six million a year. Four to six links. million a, a year. A year, uh, absolutely. Man. And so that's that's the request that our biologists, our management biologists have, yeah. have put in. And so the management team, they go out and they do their sampling and, and they say, this is what we need to supplement the stocking to, to have maintain our population and make it yeah. better mm -hmm. and get these better genetics out there as well. And so that's what we're doing, four to six million uh, a, a year. And so now in 2022, we will have four to six million bass going into the state of Texas bodies of water that all have the genetic potential to reach this size. Yeah, that's right. That is absolutely amazing. Yeah. I mean, I mean that, that makes me excited to have a kid one day, hopefully. And, yeah. and you know, those fish, like the, the, the fry that my 
fish produce, hopefully, in the, yeah. in the hatchery here that I gave to the program, um, maybe my kid could catch the, Absolutely. the descendant of one of I my I mean, fish. when you look up there at our, our ancestry charts and some of those things, yep. um, and, you're, and we certainly stock many more Floridas um, prior to moving to this Lone Star program uh, yeah. this year and being able to, well, being able to implement the Lone Star Bass program this year, um, you know, we were stocking still that four to six million Floridas. Yeah. And, you know, last year we stocked a quarter million share lunker offspring is what we were able to get out of those yeah. uh, fish, which is, you know, great. But so we're pale in comparison to the, the Floridas. But now we've got the creme to the creme uh -huh. of the Floridas with these Lone Star Bass. Yeah. And uh, we're excited about what that brings to the table. That's awesome. And, and we look back, and, and even when you're looking, that's what I was getting at, when you're looking at um, these share lunker offspring, that the numbers that we've been able to put out compared to our, our big Florida program are much smaller, and yet we're yeah. still seeing relationships, relationships, relationships. Correct. From uh, a mother fish. that, was, that yeah. was spawned here. Like when you see share lunker number nine. Uh-huh that spawned share lunker 184, yeah. that spawned share lunker 350, that then spawned two different share lunkers. I mean, when you're sitting there seeing nine and 10 fish, yeah. six generations deep coming off of share lunker number nine. Mm -hmm. I mean, Joe Castle's fish, 583, yeah. it's a descendant, it's a Lake Nacogdoches Lake record, it's a descendant of nine. It's crazy. Tyler State Park Lake record, descendant of nine. Yeah. Coleman City Lake record, Descended of nine. That's decades. <laughs> right. Separated, correct. And we're talking from, you know, Gosh. 90s to up here, and, you know, 30 years later. Yeah, and yeah. we're looking six generations of these fish spawning and spawning. And, exactly. And um, that's, that's, that's not a statistical anomaly, right? No, that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like, say so. There's something behind that, right? Correct. Or, or something to them genetics there, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would have to agree. So why do you think... 2021 because if we if we look back at the chart here and you look at how many were legacies as in 13 pluses that were given the program within january through march why was 2021 such a big jump from 20 really 2014 to 2020 well so part of it was um it wasn't that the fish weren't out there or not necessarily being caught. Now, we've had more fish being caught, sure. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things to, to, to unravel in this, yeah, right? Because yeah. it's never just one thing. Correct. Uh, part of it is, uh, was some of that negativity uh, out there about the program and people didn't, didn't trust to share their fish. Yeah. And so I, I really appreciate the time with you to be able to share and talk about some of the things that we do and, and actually some of our more recent performance when it comes to you know, say that last five years since 2018, a 94% survival rate mm -hmm. of these fish. And so, or, you know, last year, 100% survival, those sort of things. And so, so helping people understand that these things that are, are being done to take care of those fish, that helps. Um, so I'll say in 2021, Ivy, of course, is a big part of this. Yeah, and Ivy, you know, for those of y'all who don't know, OH Ivy is a lake in Texas that I caught my fish at. Yes. Eventually, all of these will be replaced. <laughs> I don't know about all that. <laughs> Not all but, of them, but uh, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of them will be, uh, will be replaced. Yeah. So so Ivy's, Ivy's a big part of that, yeah. um, obviously. Um, when you have you know, 12 fish out of 24 this season come on out of one lake, that's a big pulse, right? Correct, that's, a, correct. that's a big jump. Yeah. That also means, like, what, three seasons ago, we only had four. Yeah. So you have four coming out with two from Alan Henry, one from Ivy, mm -hmm. and and uh, and and so you got four coming out. Well, that four still is. I mean, you're still talking. Like, even if you took Ivy out of the equation, uh -huh. you still went up twelve. You That's went, true. You're right. I mean, you tripled Correct. what you're doing. So what does that? Well, part of that I think um, is we had some some fish caught early on from places like Lake Conroe, mm -hmm. like which is in the Houston area. Correct. Like Austin. And, and those news stories pick up early in January about mm. big fish being caught. And so part of it is people actually fishing for big fish. Yeah. Right? You know the most important lure in your tackle box is the one that you have confidence in. That is true. Yes. And so having confidence that, that fishing for big fish can produce a big fish yeah. is a big deal to catching big fish. So I think that early on, again, people, that, people having that belief that they can catch these big fish was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, there was some major promotion of some of those fish at Ivy being caught early on. Yeah. And so that drove a lot of people fishing there for those. And then the ones Correct. that couldn't go there were fishing for big fish elsewhere. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's certainly a part of it. 
live scope is a part of it, forward facing sonar. It's not right. the only thing, but yep. it is an impact. Yep. You know, we had half of the fish caught this year were caught using forward facing sonar. Only half. Right. Like you would think it's every fish, right? Yeah, yeah, you'd think it's so. It's not. Like we, we asked the anglers, like, uh -huh. hey, you know, and, and it was about half of them. I mean, the guy at Eagle Mountain caught his on a Texas rig in like six feet of water or something, <laughs> yeah. right? A 16 out of that shallow. Yeah. I didn't even know largemouth that were that big, lived that shallow. Yeah, you'd be surprised. All. I mean, yeah. actually, especially with blue catfish on another note, uh -huh. how big, like you got a 75 pound blue cat that's in a foot and a half of water, Yeah, you know? And you're like, you, I didn't even uh -huh. realize that fish was there. Mm -hmm. Like you're, it's amazing how shallow sometimes that they are. Got it. Cool. And how, you know, so, um, so anyway, I think that's, there's a lot of things that, that went into it, you know, certainly yeah. uh, we're doing the right things. We're doing the, putting our best foot forward. Correct. And, and I want to, I want to put that out there too. Our biologist, are doing everything they can mm -hmm. and so we're doing the habitat work we're trying to have the right regulations based upon our sampling right so that, yeah. that those are, are doing that as well so we got habitat we've got regulations and then we're stocking supplementally stocking we're putting out the best genetics that we can so all the things that we can kind of control mm -hmm. or have some influence over we're doing the best that we can got it there's plenty of things though that are outside of our control. That's true. Right? Water yeah. levels outside of our control, mm -hmm. for instance. And that was one thing that really helped, I think, at Ivy were some of those pulses of of habitat that grew yep. on the shorelines that then got flooded. And then it happened again and it happened again. Correct. Right. Um, the other thing was I was in the middle of nowhere. It wasn't gonna fish that hard. Yeah. So it was kind of a best kept secret. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you know. Exactly, so, exactly. Um, anyway, so that's that's certainly a part of it. So there's a lot of things that bake into into that. Yeah. And there's only so many things that are in our control, but the things that are within our control, I can assure you that our inland fisheries team is doing the best that they can to put our best foot forward on it. Yeah. And so we're gonna talk about uh, structure and cover and habitat here in a mm -hmm. second. But you mentioned Ivy went down, all the bushes grew, it went up, went back down, more bushes and trees grew. And I can say that it, it, it was, it was when I fished there for the four days I've been there, it has the most habitat of any lake besides mm -hmm. like grassy lakes yeah. I've ever been to. Do you expect Lake Fork to have a boom because it's been down for a year now and there's been bushes and trees? Oh yeah. And so, so if those who don't know, Lake Fork, you know, had to be uh, drawn down about six feet yeah. for repairing the dam. And it's been down for a while. And by the way, the Sabine River Authority there that controls mm -hmm. uh, the the, uh, the lake, and uh, they're just tremendous partners. They yeah. care about big bass. They work so hard with us cool. to do you know to do habitat projects to whatever you know we can do to partner on. Sabine River Authority really cares about Lake Fork. The community cares about Fork. They get it you exactly. Know? Yeah. And so we we love that. So they're great partners. But anyway, to your question, um, yes, I think that lake. You know, having a little bit of a drawdown, you're seeing some habitat grow up. Mm -hmm. You're seeing some time to do that. Um, you've also concentrated some of the prey, so those okay. bigger fish are, you know, able to to better, you know, when you concentrate yeah. that prey, be able to feed without putting out as much energy to get mm -hmm. that food. Yep. Um, and so we're seeing that. Plus, you know, we do have a good, you know, year class happening out there. I mean, there's there's a five to seven, eight pound kind of year class. And mm -hmm. there we see a good group of those coming on. Now on the vein of, of lakes that are changing, uh, we have two new lakes yeah. that are being built in Texas. The first two in how many years? Oh my gosh. Well, you gotta remember there's a big reservoir building boom in the fifties, right? Okay. And so that's following drought, you know, yeah. our first, you know, first lake built in the late 1800s, 1901, like Wichita was built, mm -hmm. you know, as the third oldest reservoir in the state. Yeah. One, there's not as many sites to build new reservoirs. Yeah. Right. People are building houses and you can't tear down that many neighborhoods. To <laughs> well, but, but you also have the right, have to have the right topography. That's true. You're right. And so yeah. you're just running out of sites in the country. And so we have to invest in our reservoirs yeah. and our aging reservoirs, not just for fishing. I mean, yeah when they when they it's not and you can have the nicest dam in the world uh -huh. <laughs> but if the lake fills up with silt it's not holding the water that you built the dam to hold anyway that's right? true that's so true. um and and water of course is the most important habitat <laughs> that any fish needs yeah uh, we like to remind folks of that like we talk about habitat well water is number one on the list yes right? it is yes it is and so uh anyway so we have two new reservoirs being built um it's it's been some time it's yeah. it's more difficult regulations to build them and things 
to build new reservoirs, run out of site. So it is rare to have new reservoirs come online. Yeah. And so we have two uh, just north uh, of, of DFW that are coming online, Ralph Hall. Okay. And then where's Ralph Hall located at? And so city wise. It, so it's north of DFW. Okay. Um, and then uh, our friends at Bass Pro Shops with the best B, uh, U.S. Open, uh -huh. they put out their habitat grants as a result of that with the National Fish Habitat Partnership. Okay. And so they've given some grants to help us make sure that it has great habitat. Cool. Better enhanced habitat from day one. Got it. So, I mean, that's really awesome. Yeah. And then also uh, Bodark Reservoir. And mm -hmm. Bodark's further along. It's filling up right now. And so that lake was built with tons of great habitat in mind. Right. Got so, it. you know, it's not just build a dam and fill up a lake. It's, hey, while that dam's yeah. building, instead of burning all those trees or removing all those trees, let's make brush piles, let's make rock mm. piles, let's make this. And so our our team up there out of out of the Denison district, out of Texoma, mm -hmm. they have been Johnny on the spot working to make sure. Yeah. And I like to call stock in the cupboard. Uh -huh. I mean, they've been doing this work to get get it ready. Yeah. And so as it comes up and then uh, on top of that, so that's, that's, and then having the right regulations from day one, those two things, that's part of what helped for it become what fork became was it really and then fork also you know got pure floridas okay. well these lakes are now getting lone star bass so that so every bass that's going to yeah. be in this lake is going to have the potential to reach that size that's right that that's and, even crazy in fact you know you might have seen the lone star law episode our team was out there mm -hmm. removing any bass that were going to like any ponds yeah that were going to get flooded that mm -hmm. were there removing those fish and replacing them with our bigger, better potential bass, that's right? That's awesome. And so that's getting, that's a big check mark for those genetics. Yeah. You know, so you got the right habitat, the right regulations, genetics. It's just gonna be, you know, really exciting to see what happens so, in those so reservoirs. It, so it'll take 10 years before we see the first <laughs> Ralph Hall Seven, Oak, seven eight, nine, ten years, because we've, you know, we've got to jump on it. As it's filling up, we've been stocking and doing those exactly. sort of things. So we've got a, a good jump on it, uh, so it won't be, 10 years from when they cut the ribbon, but, okay, cool. uh, but uh, so we've already started that clock ticking. Them, and so uh, we're, we're, we're excited. I can tell you that much to awesome. see these reservoirs coming on for our anglers and to yeah. build them right from the start. Me too. I mean, it's, it's almost like when somebody builds a five acre private lake at their, their house or their, their farm, and they can put whatever brush piles, whatever fish, <laughs> yeah. fish feeders in it. And people want to come there. As a matter of fact, people will pay money to fish private places because they have such good fishing. I think that's what Texas is kind of doing for everybody, yeah, not we, just private fishing we'll places. We only do it for $30 a year. Exactly. <laughs> for, for your fishing license, you'll be able to fish lakes that have been built for the enjoyment of Texans and people around town. I mean, like, anyway. Yeah. So why do we do this bass, too? I mean, this is the most highly sought after sport fish in North America. Exactly. You know, it's it's yeah. outstanding. It's and, fun. And so that makes me feel even better. And for those of y'all watching who might be, again, you're unsure if you catch a share lunker, should I turn it in? Is it going to survive? Is it going to be okay? Uh, you, by buying a fishing license, by starting up a, a friend, chapter, Friends of Reservoirs. Or starting a Friends of Reservoirs chapter and doing habitat work with your biologist. Yeah. You know, those work days are great, helping raise funds that way. All when you buy things. fishing gear, by the way, sport fish restoration dollars are in there. Okay. So you can tell your your, your spouse, you know, that, hey, I'm, I'm going to go do an act of conservation and, you know, go out, <laughs> buy a bunch of fishing gear. A hundred dollar act of conservation <laughs> over here. But that's so cool that all of that goes into building better fisheries for that's right. everybody. That's right. That's right. Which is awesome. And I'm, I'm excited for that. Now, that's enough with the gushy, we love, we, we love Texas stuff. Um, it is time to get into some of the... Uh, theories, uh -huh. the, uh, sure. the things to debunk that's, that I've seen on, like I said, forums and Facebook pages. Uh, and we're going to start with some easy ones. When you donate a fish to the Sherry Lunker program, you will never see it again. So you tell me, is that true? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not only did I get to see it in my hands going back into the lake, I got to come here and see it uh, just before it was spawning, um, but in, in the tank getting rejuvenated. So no, that's not true. Yeah. Pretty, so, pretty easy one to do. I mean, he, and actually, even if uh, the rare chance at, at, at this point was growing into a, a, a rare chance, because again, we're still not perfect. Some of those fish die. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've had a really good run and we're doing the right stuff. We expect to have low mortality and, and uh, even the, we give it back to you. It's your fish. What do you want to do with it? That's true. You know, we this is your fish. We we work with the anglers hand in hand 
to to make those decisions mm -hmm. on, on how to move forward when those things happen. Yeah. You know, so do you, do you want it back? Do you if you don't want it back, guess what we're going to do? We're going to we're going to open that fish up and we're going to take its odorless out. And we're going to age it and get one more data point out of it. Yeah. We get one more piece of knowledge. Exactly. To move forward. How do you think we know that they're if on it average? dies, if it dies, how do you think we know on average that they're 10 years old? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. because we, some we've of, aged those fish exactly um so so no you'll see it again you definitely will see it again yes and you also see a replica again when you when you give it to us too because uh exactly we're going to make you a, a replica and then you can release the release the live fish when we're done with it and, you get, and you get to have a great replica mount from lake fork taxidermy put up on your wall and i'm excited to get my replica so that's the first one um all the new, so the, when bass are spawned, they start as fry, a little tiny, for those of y'all who are not very, you know, understanding of this, they start as fry, then they grow to fingerlings, which are what, an inch, three inches? Inch to three inches, Okay, yeah. that's a fingerling. So how, people say that all the new fingerlings, from like if I donate my fish to the program, all my fingerlings go into Lake Fork and private lakes. So, <laughs> so actually, uh, there's a moratorium on stocking private waters. We're not allowed legally to stock private waters yeah. at Texas Parks and Wildlife. If you call our hatchery, which happens regularly, and say, <laughs> how much do these fish cost to buy? Yeah. We say, here's a list of hatcheries in the state that you sh you know should yeah. inquire about their rates because yeah. we don't sell fish. Exactly. Um, so, no, we're not going to stock private waters. We're not going to sell your fish. Um, you know, so your fish... Uh, Lake Fork, Lake Fork gets a lot of bass, right? Lake yeah. Fork gets a lot of Florida largemouth, Lone Star largemouth now. Yeah. Does it get share lunkers? You get share lunkers if it produces a share lunker. Yeah. And so the way that uh, we typically do that is whatever number of share lunkers are turned in, if your lake produced this percentage of it, you get that percentage of the fingerlings back. Got it. And so even if you're fish, Tyler, so, you know, Jesse's fish came from Houston County Lake. Yeah. So if Jesse's fish didn't survive or if it didn't which it did it didn't it survive did, yeah. but even if it didn't you know spawn houston county lake because he tried he gave it to us yeah. is going to get a portion of those fish cool back and so every lake is get, that turns in share lunkers has shown that everything's lined up there mm -hmm. to make share lunkers correct and that's the thing like now here's proof this lake is doing good things all the stuff is lining up it's making big fish yeah we want to put these extra special fish back there to take advantage of Correct. the special situations. Correct. And that's part of it too, right? Yeah. So yeah. no, I mean, yeah, Fort Fort gets gets plenty of fish, and when Fort produces lunkers, it gets fish too. But well, and it produced almost all the lunkers back in the and day. And it didn't get any share lunker offspring this year because it didn't produce one. Correct. You know. Got it. So, man, well, good to know. I can't just buy a few from my own private lake. <laughs> I think the very widespread. I believe, uh, matter of fact, I believe this until this year, was that fish fully spawn successfully in the wild, nature knows best. So somebody says, I'm gonna release my fish. There was a, a very popular internet personality who claimed that in his video this past year, caught a 14 and said, I'm gonna let it go spawn right now. I'm not gonna give it to the program. I'm gonna let it spawn. Yeah. What's the, what's the data on, uh, success rate on a spawn yeah. in the wild so think about this like we have a controlled environment with everything that fishery science puts to it to Correct. say this is what it needs to spawn right here's the thing is is that fish may spawn in the wild yeah it may not we got to remember that not every fish spawns every year especially when we're talking about some of these fish that are nearing the end of their natural mm -hmm. lifespan yeah Right, these are geriatric fish. They right. takes a long time yeah. to get this old or get this big, and so, so that's even less, you know, likely. The other thing about that is you can release it to spawn, and even if it does spawn out there, it's highly unlikely mm -hmm. it's spawning with a male offspring of a previous lunker. Correct. Right. So, so it's diluting its potential success. When of you its offspring. when you release that lunker back into the lake and say, well, it's going to spawn here, what you're doing is saying. I'm okay with you spawning with some other normal bass instead of yeah. guaranteeing that we're going to double down on those genetics of big bass. Yeah. When you give that fish to us, when you loan that fish to us to spawn, you're saying, man, I, I want to double down on big bass genetics for the future of this, of this fish. Yeah. That's what you're doing. You want to give that up? I don't want to give that up. Yeah. You know, the other, like I said though, and then if they even if they do spawn in the wild, which they do, you yeah. know, yeah. I'm what's not the, saying they all don't. Some, yeah, what's the what's do. the living rate of a of a fingerling? Yeah, think about that. So think about that is 
is they're not in an ideal situation. They have predators out there, mm -hmm. right? They have environmental variables that are not being controlled. You have cold fronts come in and wipe out a spawn, or yeah. you have uh, a fish gets taken off the nest, or and it dies, and then there's no nest protection. Uh, you know, a lot of them go back and protect the nest too. But then, you know, so yeah. there's a lot of other things out there trying to eat you. Correct. You yeah. know, so when you're here, we control those things, and yeah. Yeah. and we do the best that we can, and and that's why you have you know so many of the fry here becoming fingerlings, right? And so when they go out into our ponds. Yeah. They're being put out. That's what we talk about that timing game. Mm -hmm. You know, we're fertilizing these ponds to have the blooms, to have the zooplankton bloom, so they can get on it. And by the way, we're also stocking those suckers out at the right time yeah. before they start to cannibalize. So bass cannibalize. Yes, they absolutely do. Okay. And so, you, yeah, if I can get my mouth around you, I'm going to eat you. That's okay. what they're going to do. So, got it, got it. So uh, really, a really cool thing uh, ecologically is, you know, while bass and, and bluegill, sunfish, they're, they're in the same family. Yeah. They're, they're related. And they're Correct. nest spawners. Yes. Well, you'll see those bluegill beds, right? Mm -hmm. It looks like a moonscape. It does. Right? You don't see bass do that, right? No. You know why they don't do that? Because they eat each other. Okay. And because Got they're it. the ones that said, I'm not going to spawn next to you, they are they were more likely to get their genes to move forward in the evolutionary history. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right? I got gotcha. Because they eat each other. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, we actually don't stock those just at the ramp. I mean, we got some really cool pictures of the, of the, of the trucks at the ramp. Yeah. But those trucks are being unloaded into our management team's boats, mm -hmm. into tanks on those boats. Yeah. And then we actually spread those out throughout the reservoir into good habitat, good habitat on the shoreline habitat yeah. um, and spread them out so that their density is lower mm. to decrease cannibalization okay. to increase their impact on the overall population. Got it. Right? Yeah, I've seen that. People say, oh, they just dump all the Sherlunker fingerlings at the ramp. No, there are some species that we can spawn at the ramp. Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, uh, stock release. at the ramp. Yeah. There are some species that we can release at the ramp. Not a big deal. Yeah. It doesn't impact the, the, their, their influence on the population. Bass are not one of those. Okay. And so our standard procedures at this department is that we actually take those and spread those throughout in good habitat in the shoreline across the lake. Mm -hmm. um, so we put that extra effort, that extra care in it, and it pays off by having more of those increase the population out there not having exactly. that cannibalization deal yeah yeah we put in you put in the extra effort to share your fish with us right uh-huh we You're, put in the extra effort all the way to so. make sure and do that all the way to support those fish making uh, impact on the population yeah that that's awesome people say that not many share lunker fish are actual descendants of previous sal's sure well remember that you know we did have higher mortality early on mm -hmm. um it does take decades a decade. to make a decade to make this fish yeah and then as you start to see others the other thing is that we were um keeping in mind the uh the fact that there were so many more i mean look at the the proportion you know we're talking about multi-millions of pure floridas versus you know typically in the tens of thousands okay. of share lunkers got it and last year of course a quarter million you know so really yeah. good yeah. years and so you're talking about so many more that are, are being stocked at our Pier Floridas. And that's why that Lone Star program is so important. So we're increasing the numbers too mm -hmm. that are going out. Mm -hmm. uh, all that impacts, you know, how many of those are coming back in there related to others. Exactly. To me, I still think like it's a win either way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, explain, to me, explain that. So it's a win either way. So if if your fish was related to a previous share locker, uh -huh. that's really cool. Yeah. That's yeah. a great thing. And now we have this extra special fish that has even more proven lineage. This isn't Peyton Manning, who's Archie Manning's son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Arch Manning, who's third down the line. Yeah. I know it's not Peyton's son, but yeah, I'm just yeah, saying yeah. it's a third generation, right? Exactly. And so uh, it's a much easier bet on what's going to happen there. Yeah. But if it's not a share lunker descendant, well, that's also a good thing too, because we're having that genetic diversity. We have right. another fish that has this proven potential, but then may have some other traits that are different. Yeah. And so we can keep that, that genetic diversity up that we need. So, yeah. so really it's a, it's a win either way just to turn it in. It's really cool when we start to see more of these come in. The other thing is over the history of the program, we, we haven't had, I mean, again, science is changing. Yeah, yeah. Science is growing and learning. We're able to track some of these things back, but you know, as we get better you know, information, better tools, 
and, and uh, the processes develop better, we're able to better tell some of these things too. Yeah. You know. So the data you collect on my fish and the fish from these years' classes 10 years from now, you'll be able to see a lot more family tree connections potentially because of the advancements of science. Well, we'll, we'll have the potential to find them if yeah. they're there. Yeah. You know? Exactly. I, we're going to tell you what the data says. The data is what the data is, right? Exactly. You know? Yeah. Uh, but we'll have a, a much greater chance of being able to pick up on that. Yep. You know? Yeah. And I there mean, was, out of this, out of the 2022 class, you said there was two yeah. that we know of so far. There were two that were, that were know, hatched here. That were offspring. In, in this building. Yeah. Released and a decade later caught. Yeah. It's pretty and cool. And then, well, shoot, we know, you know, any of the pure Florida's that were caught this year, we absolutely, you know, did. <laughs> when we look at the three from Possum Kingdom. That's true. The, all three of the Possum Kingdom fish are pure Florida's. And you go track them back 10 years, that's a stocking that occurred after that lake had a golden algae kill. Yeah. That killed pretty much every fish in that lake, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so we restocked that. And here we are 10, 11 you know, yeah. years later and we're getting trophy bass out of there. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's, it's, so it's I feel like more, most people think that they're not most people. Some people think the Sri Lanka program is like separate from the, the Florida strain stocking program, but really, they enhance each other to where mm -hmm. now it's an it's a super program yeah. <laughs> of, of even be, even better bass yes which is, absolutely. Which, which is so cool now this one here is again i said we're going to circle back to this topic uh, and I, this one was quoted from somebody on facebook the Sri Lanka program does more harm than good because it's all about forage base and lake management like cover structure and regulations than it is about genetics so, so growing big bass is more about grass than it is about genetics can you answer that one well, absolutely. Guess what? Uh, Ireland Fisheries team cares about that too. Yeah. All right. We do that too. So that's what I'm talking about. The, our management team's out there doing habitat work. Uh, our research team's uh, doing research on, uh, on regulations and evaluating yeah. potential regulation changes. Uh, we've done a ton of work on that over the years. We've been very progressive uh, since the 80s. But Texas has been progressive on, on largemouth bass regulations. Yeah. So cover, structure, habitat, regulations, absolutely that's part of the game. Yeah. That's what we're doing. That's what our inland fisheries team is doing. And guess what? Genetics are too. Yeah. And stocking is a part of that. Mm -hmm. And stocking is part of it too. And so we're not leaving any part of the game, right? We're uncovering, we're, we're turning over every rock, every nook and cranny to make sure that we're putting our best foot forward on everything that we possibly can yeah. to make the best bass fishing in Texas. Hey, I always say it's like, you may not like uh, special teams, uh -huh. you know, but you're not just going to play offense and defense in football. Yeah, that's true. You're still going to kick your PATs, right? Yeah. You yeah. may not think that this is a big deal. There's a lot of games that are won or lost on your ability to do special teams. Yeah, exactly. Well, you can think of genetics as those special teams that, that we're making sure that we're doing that, that very well, too. Awesome. And I think the last thing that a certain portion of people have against the program is almost like I call it the morality argument. So they just don't feel like it's moral to, once you catch the fish, uh, transport it in a truck across the state, keep it in a small tank in an environment that it's not used to, you know, it doesn't have as wide to swim. It's kind of like this, the, the wild animals in the zoo argument. Um, and I, I know people who haven't turned in Sri Lankers for that reasoning. So do, what, what's your answer? Or what's the Sri Lanka program's answer to the moral argument? Hey, it's your fish. Yeah. Uh, if you have if you have a, an issue with that, we totally respect that, and we respect your uh, your decision to to release that fish right away and put yeah. it back in the you know reservoir in that man made habitat. You know, we're, we're totally yeah. you know fine with that. Yeah. Uh, we 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 um, you know we would prefer that it's turned in to help us to to do our best to to make more fish. I Correct. mean, frankly, this program made that fish in the first place. Yeah. At some way, shape, or form, the Ireland Fisheries team have made those fish. Yeah. Um, so I'm not gonna tell anybody, uh, I'm not gonna question anybody's personal moral ethics. That's that's certainly a personal, very personal thing. Correct. Uh, what I will say though is, is that um, somebody pr providing share lunkers in the past, somebody, uh, biologist working hard on mm -hmm. those lakes, helped to produce those for you. Me personally, I have a sense of gratitude for that. Yeah. And I want to help pass that on to other people too. Uh, and I will tell you that uh, the work that we put in to provide these absolutely the best comfort and condition and care. You know, we didn't just throw your 
your fish in the back of that truck and, <laughs> and go to Whataburger, you know, and exactly. chill out. Like, exactly. No, we're, we're doing everything we can to get that fish back here in a, in a safe manner. And we're checking on it regularly throughout the trip, mm -hmm. trip checking on water quality, water temperature, uh, fish health, any, anything that we can do to minimize any stress on that fish whatsoever. Yeah. You know, like we, we go to me I, I, above and beyond yeah. to do everything we can to provide the best possible environment and experience for these fish. Yeah. So, you know. I'm not gonna tell anybody that they're certainly welcome to, to their beliefs and their opinions. And, yeah. and uh, we wanna uh, respect that. And we also wanna thank those that uh, give us the opportunity uh, by sharing their fish so we can uh, use those to, yeah. to make the best possible fishing for everybody else. Yeah, and, and kind of going forward now into, into legacy, you know, you guys have created Bigger Better Bass for Texans. Now, um, I've had comments of people asking me, hey, why isn't Florida doing a share longer program or why isn't uh, New York or Pennsylvania? What do you think is um, holding some states back? And have you seen just some, uh, you know, themes of states learning from you guys and what you've done? Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe some, some people that are talking about doing it for themselves. Yeah, well, first off, um, other states that aren't doing it, uh, they're not doing it because they're not us. And what I mean by that is, our situation here is our situation here. Correct. It's not the same as Pennsylvania. It's not the same as Missouri. Yeah. Uh, and I have no doubt that the biologists that are, you know, in other states, they're dedicated their life to fishery science, yeah. to doing the best that they can to manage the resources in their state as well. Correct. Right. So, you know, while they're not doing it, uh, there's a lot of things that go into doing this. Like I said, it's an angler industry mm -hmm. uh, partnership. Uh, agency partnership. Well, it, <laughs> it does. Costs a lot it of does. Money. It does take funds to do things. Yeah. And um, when they make those decisions on what they think is best, they they have to allocate those dollars on what they think is best to make the best fisheries in their state. Yeah. Um, our program won't work everywhere. Yeah. It certainly works for us. Correct. We do know that it won't work everywhere, and and pure Florida's won't work everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but they uh, they certainly work here. Um, across the southeast, uh, they, they do pretty well. Yeah. Um, but there are other efforts, you know. We talk about the importance of habitat. We talk about the importance of prey base. Correct. When we allocate efforts to do genetic pieces, those are efforts and resources that maybe we could do more over there. Mm -hmm. We think that what we're doing there is sufficient, and we want to make sure we're doing this as well. Other states may not have that luxury. Yeah. Uh, so they have to pick what they can and can't do. Correct. And so uh, that said, though, what we're doing here we, we certainly talk. Yeah. You know, we certainly uh, go to, to biologist meetings and, and learn from each other and publish papers and, mm -hmm. and, and do presentations and those sort of things. We talk, we learn from each other. So what is happening here and the, and the efforts that our anglers here, yeah. that helps other states too. Cool. And what they're doing in Florida and what they're doing in Georgia, that helps us too. You know, we're all, exactly. we're all trying to work together to, to make the best fishing possible. Yeah. Um, there's certainly other states that have, have looked into this and may, and may do it in the future. Cool. Um, but you know, you gotta, there's a whole lot of things going on. that has gotta, you know, there come is. together. One, you gotta think that it's actually going to produce those results. Correct. And it's a different situation everywhere. I'm just glad that we live in a state where it's the situation's here, man. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we got the 75 <laughs> plus lakes. Now, do you think there's more than 75 that have been, there are lakes that somebody maybe didn't even know about the program or just decided not to turn it in? Like are there 85, hundred lakes in Texas that have oh. legacy fish in them? Oh, there certainly could be. I mean, we yeah. have uh, lots of reservoirs out there and, and smaller impoundments. I mean, Lake Daniel wasn't very big, 1,100 acres. I've been to Daniel. And, it, is, it is tiny. <laughs> and so, I mean, and, and it's produced, I mean, we've got a, a really good bit of, of lakes that size and, um, yeah. you know, they don't. And the other thing is, you know, sometimes people just aren't geared up to, to catch those. They may hook one. They and, may hook a 13. And, I mean, <laughs> you know, and then ting. <laughs> yep. And you're like, well, there you go. So, exactly. no, I, I think there certainly are. Uh, a lot more at 75 that, that have produced and or have, yeah. you know, 13 plus pounders in the state, which is saying a lot because mm -hmm. that's, again, a really, really rare fish. Gosh. But by the way, um, that's 75 that have been turned into the program. Okay. Right. Since 1986 when the program started. Yeah. Right. So that's not, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's certainly more than 75 lakes that have produced 13 plus pound bass in the that's state. That's cool. 
we'll finish on my uh, my fish. So Cheryl Lunker 609. Yeah. What what genetic makeup do we know, just for people who are curious, about my fish that I caught? Yeah, so it's, again, it's mostly Florida. It's mostly Florida. It's, it's not a pure Florida bass, okay. but it's the majority of it is Florida. Uh, I think it was, what, 73? 73%. Yeah, uh, uh, percent Florida. And so, so yeah, it was uh, it was an integrate is what we call that. Okay. Um, it was actually group spawned, and so we put it into... Um, a group with two others, because we had so many, we actually group spawned those. Okay. Now we had three fish um, in that group spawn, and they produced multiple spawns. Okay. And so, so three fish and three males, or three fish and one male? Oh no, three fish and multiple males. Okay, a bunch of no, males. No, no, no. We give these ladies uh, multiple <laughs> suitors to okay. choose from. Got it. And by the way, if they don't like those suitors, they gone. Uh -huh. We put more in there. We put swap them out. Got it. Uh, to give them the best chance to cool. to, to spawn. And so we're actually doing the, uh, we, so we pulled those spawns, but you know, they spawn in the middle of the night or we're not, it's not like we have a camera on them or anything mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to know exactly which fish spawn. So yeah. we're doing the genetic testing of the fry to tie those back. So exactly. there's a, there's a better and average chance that your fish is one of those that spawned. And cool. And when we get that through our, our genetics lab, we'll know yeah. um, that this batch, you know, hopefully came from mm -hmm. Sherlocker 609 yeah. and and this is the number of progeny from that batch and Dang. and uh how many fish thanks to thanks to you that are now supercharged share lunker offspring they're going back out there i wild. love it in my video i call them super bass babies <laughs> and so you know i just wanted to finish by thanking tom for letting me come and interview you uh let me be a part of the program you know you, you kept mentioning it, it it's hitting me i didn't grow up thinking it as share lunker right it was like share lunker it's like one word yeah. But I'm seeing it now as like I am sharing my lunker with you, and then you are helping that that share to split off into yeah. everybody in the state of Texas and who travels here to fish, which is which means the world to me. And for well, you know people out there watching, if you catch a share lunker, you will then be able to be fully a part of what I have been able to, uh, which is help people in Texas catch well, better. Here's guys. the deal, you know, in your life that we're always better together. Correct. Whenever we work together, great things happen. And yeah. this program is the antithesis of industry, our, our great anglers in the state, yeah. working with our committed biologists, you know, uh, our share lunker team, our hatchery teams, our management teams, all in the Inland Fisheries Division here at Texas Parks and Wildlife, working with their anglers. Man, when that happens and that comes together, mm -hmm. we're all going to the same goal. Man, really great things happen. It does. We got some great stuff happening with the Share Lunker program with Texas Bass Fishing. We invite all y'all to come down here and yeah. give it a shot. And so I think after all this, you know, the question that we started with was, should humans be breeding largemouth bass to put in public lakes? And I, I think the answer is yes. If you want to catch them, if you want to, if you want to catch them, if you want your grandkids to catch them, uh, we should all be working together yeah. for the for the greater. State I think of Texas. that's that's the deal. If you want to continue to produce great fisheries, if you want to show your gratitude for having the opportunity to catch great fish uh, in your state and in Texas, then uh, we all have that responsibility to do our part. Exactly. You know, uh, some of us are biologists, some of us are anglers, some of us are industry folks and yep. we all come together to make bigger better bass yep. for current and future generations exactly and again i'm biased and as a scientist to say i'm biased i think people that fish are much better than people that don't fish <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, I'll agree with you there i like so it. let's make more better people <laughs> exactly awesome well tom it's good to see you i yeah. appreciate you and uh you'll see my fish right up there next year 18.19 <laughs> i look forward to it <laughs> we'll see you guys next time